what makes them different from us is obviously like 7.7 watts per kilo for 20 minutes. Like I'm not going to do that anytime soon. Almost no one is ever going to do that. Um, but if you take that out of the equation, it's their ability to like synthesize information uh, when going fast, specifically going fast downhill. This is Andrew Vance, and you're listening to Choose the Hard Way, where I explore the obstacles people overcome to do great things with peak performers from business, sports, tech, the arts, the military, and more. You are what you overcome. Choose the hard way. Before we roll, I want to say thank you to everyone who's left us an iTunes review. And if you haven't left us an iTunes review, please hit the link in the show notes take a second and leave a one word review and hit five stars. I do this show because I love bringing you the stories of my guests and I really appreciate you taking a second to support the show. Thank you. In the early 2000s, one of the freelance journalism gigs I enjoyed the most was writing Tour de France commentary for Fox Sports during the Lance and Floyd Landis eras. I love cycling and cycling journalism, and my guest is Spencer Martin, who is one of the hottest creative and business talents in cycling journalism today. Spencer is the founder of Beyond the Peloton. It's a freemium substack and podcast that analyzes pro road racing at an unprecedented level of depth. I had a blast appearing on Spencer's podcast a while back, and I always enjoy hearing his take on what's happening in pro cycling. If you love bike racing too, I highly recommend you buck up and treat yourself to a subscription to Spencer's exclusive content at beyondthepeloton.substack.com. You can find that link in the show notes. And whether you're a pro cycling fan or not, you're gonna dig this conversation. Spencer and I go deep on the business of sports, the future of content, the Tour de France, rim breaks, growing up in the Midwest, his journey from elite junior runner to entrepreneur, things that motorists have thrown at us while we're out riding our bikes, and much more. Andrew was asking if he sounded like Terry Gross, and I said that the NPR has been podcasting long before we even knew what the medium was. That's right. I, I do believe Terry Gross is a pioneer of the format, bringing some of the best content into the podcast of Earth since then. Where do you think podcasting is going, Spencer? Uh, it's great. Great question. Uh, I, I fear my concern is that it, I hope it does not turn into radio. Um, I love NPR, big NPR fan, but I think they were good because they're so different from like commercial radio. Um, and I think the commercial pressures are what make uh, like particularly sports radio so bad um there it's not interesting it's really doesn't reward interesting conversations or like moderation and any type of take I, I get slightly concerned when spotify is doing you know spotify we have these big major players moving into what was like a really open medium and i get a little concerned that it's just going to end up like blogging did you know if you remember the right. early days of blogging everything I do. was open people could make money uh, I, uh, my concern is what happens if, if Apple and Spotify really start competing and they, they become, you know, they're able to kind of programmatically put in ads and everything just gets like pinched down to the lowest common denominator. Right. I hope, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, I also think there's a lot of room for growth. I mean, you think of even a really famous podcaster like Bill Simmons. I mean, how many people in my daily life know who Bill Simmons is? Probably not that many. So even the big stars are, are pretty niche still. And so there, there could be quite a bit of room for growth. Yeah, I think there's definitely still room for growth, but you make a fantastic point, Spencer. And in a lot of ways, what you're describing, which is there's in media and content, there's often the cycle, something starts out, it's disruptive, it's innovative, and then it's circular and it ends up becoming the thing it was disrupting, like blogging in many ways did that blogging is you know i mean it, it's really a part of all mainstream forms of media in different ways podcasting over time potentially becoming more like radio and it's just reminding me of what's happening with gravel racing 
So do you, yeah. do you see a parallel here? Is there is there a spirit of podcasting similar to a spirit of gravel? There's definitely a spirit of podcasting. <laughs> definitely, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's just as hard. It's just as as gnarly. Um, we're definitely as cool as the people winning gravel races. I would I would say that for sure. Um, but no, but seriously, it yeah, I I do get concerned that it's it's this kind of endless cycle of uh, like grassroots growth disruption. Uh, cons- consolidation and then ultimately demise. And but I mean, what's cool is the cycle starts over again. I mean, what are we going to be doing in twenty years instead of podcasting? I, I we like, are we just going to? I don't even know. Will we just be beaming directly into people's brains and be like, whoa, check out this new thing? It's not like podcasting. There, there. It's just transcendental thoughts implanted into my head directly from someone from a host. But yeah, I do get concerned that it will it, probably the, the thing that concerns me the most is the ability to auction ads basically at light speed at unlimited supply. We like that's basically what's killed websites like that. That's why you don't go to a website unless you absolutely have to, because then any type of inefficiency or creativity gets blood out of a marketplace and um it's something I worry about a lot, actually, with, you know, it's like, well, when will Google basically ru- ruin the email inbox? And that will just become what Google search has become, where you search for something and it's an entire page of ads. And if you're a play, like a small player who's just creating good content, you really, it's hard to get noticed in Google searches now. I think you're on to something with biological technology or the confluence of thought transmission and some kind of biological form of the transmission of those ideas. I'm thinking of the David Cronenberg movie Existence starring Jude Law. I don't know if you remember that hit film. I don't think I've, I don't think I've okay. seen this one. Yeah, I mean, Cronenberg, of course, like, wow, one of my favorite filmmakers, but Existence was about this biological video game system that jacked into a port in your spine and then you entered the world of the game and could physically feel what was happening in the game not quite the same as like an elon musk brain implant neural implant type of thing but i think that your prediction for 20 years from now is probably apt we probably will be doing some kind of transmission and receiving of direct thought but i mean on that note why are rim brakes dying in professional cycling? <laughs> this is a great question. Great question. Uh, I actually can't think of a more important question for the modern time. Um, I'm like a I'm a rim brake evangelist. Like uh, same. I never never thought I would go to disc. Um, thought discs were so stupid. I, uh, let's. I mean, I should clarify. Mountain bikes. I think disc brakes are awesome. Um, yeah. I I cannot believe that I ever rode dim- rim brakes on a mountain bike. Um, kind of the same thing with tubeless, where just the tubeless technology on a mountain bike is much better. I right. think particularly because you can run such low pressures. I think tubeless gets complicated once you start increasing that pressure up towards 100 PSI. But with rim brakes on road bikes, I thought they were so dumb. Like, when have you ever really not had the stopping power, at least when it's dry on a, on a road bike? Sure. Um, but having said that, uh, for re- racing many years on carbon rims yeah it is it is very poor in the wet and i'd be coming down mountains in the wet and thinking like well i couldn't stop if i had to like maybe this is a problem and so over time i, I did kind of start to warm up to the idea of uh i mean with with disc brakes you do have to have caustic hydraulic fluid coursing through your bike um if you want to travel with it i would be concerned that it would like rupture a brake line and then you kind of have a big problem when you land um, so for easy use, for changing wheels, rims a lot better. Do I need more complication in my riding life? Probably not. I'm a big believer in like, if you're the simpler your setup is, the more often you're going to get on it. Um, the less repairs you have to do, the more often you're going to get on it and ride the bike. On the other hand, I'm I'm getting addicted to wider tires on road bikes. I was like okay. one of those guys out there r- riding like 19C tires in like 2008 being like this is speed like this is the pinnacle of speed right now right um i slowly moved up to 25 and then with the with the disc brakes i think the best part is you can just put 
really big tires on your road bike. And I think you can go up to 20, 28, 30 millimeters and still be really fast on the road. I mean, p- potentially as fast, if not faster than with, with smaller tires. So um, that's kind of where I, I've landed, where I, I do I do ride a rim brake road bike, but I'm like just curious. I think probably the next bike I get, uh, it will be a disc or next yeah road bike I get will be a disc bike. Yeah, and Spencer, I know that you're very well sourced within the world of professional cycling. I also know in season two of the Movie Star documentary on Netflix, the writers clearly like they do not want to be on disc brakes, and they say that on camera, which kind of shocked me to hear some of the things they were saying about their equipment suppliers. But what are you hearing from inside the pro peloton? What do writers actually want? It's funny you say that. <clears throat> I was going to buy that bike that the Movistar team rides. And then I watched the season two and I was like, they were like, this is not a good bike. It's not made for disc brakes. It's terrible. And I didn't buy it because of that. I mean, Canyon cannot be too happy about that. I was shocked that that was, was in there. As far as a pro Peloton is, it's kind of this funny disconnect where I feel like fans and enthusiasts, we worry so much about the technology. Like we obsess about it. I feel like the riders are the least almost like the least plugged in. I, so, I mean, some riders are really obsessive. Like uh, Tony Martin was, was always really obsessed with his setup. Um, Chris Froome is, is pretty obsessive. And actually Chris Froome has come out publicly saying he doesn't like the disc brake bike they were given. He prefers rim brakes. Um, I think it is like a, it's a smattering of, of uh, opinions. We are seeing more off-road racers get into road racing and they tend to be more, pro disc brakes just because it's what they're used to um i just think some of that comes down to like rivalry like kind of uh just the rivalry between road and off-road i'm not sure if that's rooted in very much reality um it seems like though the riders you just kind of ride what you're given and you're happy to have a bike sponsor i don't think the rank and file is like sitting around reminiscing about the days of rim brakes but i do find it interesting that once riders get a voice it doesn't seem like many have come out and said, I really, really like disc brakes. I really like racing on them. Um, having said that, if you go back and watch the 2020 Tour de France, it does seem like Julian Alaphilippe was descending faster due to his disc brakes versus the rim brakes. So, you know, despite what the riders say, it, uh, and as much as it pains me to say it, it does seem like you could have like a material advantage descending on disc brakes versus rim brakes though in my opinion if you're braking on a descent while racing you're doing something wrong like you like you really need to be railing that descent with minimum minimum braking to really be competitive yeah, that's one of the many things that blows my mind about professional cycling that i think the average fan or average person might not be aware of but they these riders do so many races every year even if they, you know, have a number of years in the world tour behind them, it's almost like in races, like they're sight reading music or they're on sighting a rock climbing route. Like they, in real time, they're having to navigate incredibly complex technical bike handling situations, read terrain. I mean, there's obviously also road furniture that they run into but yeah it's just psych pro cycling is an incredibly incredibly dangerous sport it's statistically as we know more dangerous than being a race car driver but just having to show up at work every day and (laughs) and and do do that like under the pressure they're under and you know being solo in front of the race is one thing it brings a certain level of pressure but being in a pack of 100 riders and doing that is also like pretty insane yeah i think this is a a really good point you bring up but it's the what makes them different from us is obviously like 7.7 watts per kilo for 20 minutes like i'm not going to do that anytime soon almost no one is ever going to do that um but if you take that out of the equation it's their ability to like synthesize information uh when going fast specifically going fast downhill uh like Mike Woods is one of the worst descenders in the professional peloton. Like you watch him on TV, you're like how I could beat this guy in a downhill. I promise you, almost no one listening to this could beat Mike Woods on a downhill. Like 
he is so much better than your even your average like local pro at descending and bike handling it's shocking and then once you get up to guys who are actually good at it relative to the professional peloton it's mind-blowing how how good at bike handling they are and it it's just, I guess it's kind of an unsatisfying answer for people, but I think a lot of it's just innate ability. Um, obviously practice helps, but there's just something slightly different about them where you just, it's coming at them so fast. Like, yeah, I've never seen this technical descent. I'm going down it at race speed. I'll figure it out on the way. Like, I, I, I don't think I could do it. Like, and, and I'm pretty good at bike handling. I ride my bike all the time and it's just, it's never going to happen. Like, that ability to, you know, kind of like being an F1 driver, like what, what makes someone a good F1 driver? It's like, it's kind of these innate processing skills that most people just don't have. I think, isn't it that you can tap a bunch of lights on a wall in front of you? Rapidly? Yeah. Like I always like, how can <laughs> I've thought about like, can I get a setup at my house where I put the tap lights in front of me? I could like have my wife activating them. We could trade yes. off. She could tap yeah. the lights. I could, we could both become, you know, world-class cognitive performers, I think. But I was telling my wife, we should all start our days, how they warm up for their races. Like we got to be doing the tap lights. Like we got to have a physio come in and stretch us out. And then like, we're ready to meet the challenges of the day. Yeah. That, and then you have to have a TheraBand that you're doing some weird, yes. somebody's pulling your arm over here. I think that's a great idea. And, you know, when you think about just cycling generally, what do you find to be compelling about it? Why is it interesting? That's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, why yeah, why invest so much time and energy into what is ostensibly a very silly sport? Um, I find it so I think growing up, I grew up in a very like very American place, um, super conservative, super American, dismissive of anything that was foreign, anything that was different. So initially I loved the, like, I grew up a Europhile just because it was, it was so different to my surroundings. And like, I loved how like the society and history of the, the countries and the regions were reflected in these races. It's almost like a little window into a, a different world that, you know, you get to see like with these Italian races, you, it, they kind of tell the story of, uh, of the unification of these kingdoms and coming together as a country. And then, you go to, you know, Giro d'Italia goes through South Tyrol and they speak German. And you're like, well, that's odd. And you're like, oh, well, you found out that it switched. It was given to Italy after they switched sides in World War I from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And you're just kind of learning these little factoids and like way, how people live and what the societies are like and what's happened in the past through these races. I think that's initially what, what drew me to it. Um, and what still, what still draws me to it. And then I also find the racing so compelling. It's like chess played out at warp speed on the roads where you have like the physical component. It's just physically difficult to ride a bike really fast. Um, but the fact that, you know, you have to be so tactically astute where I grew up a runner. I was like running at a high level in, in middle school and in high school, and running's like there is a tactical element but it's so it's so straightforward compared to cycling where i was really drawn to like the added level of of depth as far as tactics tactics and strategy went and where did you grow up spencer um so i grew up i went to high school in lawrence kansas which is close to your hometown of kansas city it's very much part of like the eastern kansas KC Metro culture, um, which is very different from, I grew up in Western Kansas in a town called Smith Center. It was like, you know, closely the Nebraska border, but they talk about like Walmart coming in and destroying small towns. Like we wished we would have, we could have been destroyed by a Walmart. Like we had to drive like three hours to get to a Walmart. Like that's how small it was and how remote it was. Wow. And if you like saw like a four lane highway, you'd like come back and tell people about it. Like, well, <laughs> I saw the interstate today. Like, no way. Like, that's crazy. So it was incredibly remote. Um, and really the only, it was just like books and we had like basic, basic sat, like not, not even satellite, just like antenna TV. So um, any book I could get my hand on, especially if it was about, europe or something different I, I was immediately into so you only read on microfiche at the library <laughs> i read a lot <laughs> yes yeah that i mean it's crazy but yeah a lot of 
my days just free time was spent just going to i'd read like the wall street journal that way at the library and then was just got like really into financial markets because it was just like wow the journal like what's wall street that's in new york look at these funny little pixelated author images and then would become obsessed with certain wall street journal authors so um it was a very interesting way to grow up so were those kind of like your dual obsessions growing up was it finance and cycling uh, i'd say like finance and sports in general like we would get college game day which is like the college show the game the pre-show for college football and like i would make my parents pick me up from sleepovers to like go home and watch it because i was worried my friends wouldn't be plugged in enough to what the analysts were saying and so it's like <laughs> 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 like i would I, I would be like outside at 8 a.m ready to get picked up and brought home to watch my college game day i mean i was just Almost to the point now where if I was the parent of myself as a child, I'd be like, are you okay? Like, do we need to take you to a therapist? Like, this is an obsession with sports. <laughs> that, that's wild. And so what drew you into cycling? I mean, you mentioned that European connection, but like what got you on a bike and in riding? Yeah. So that's like the lamest answer ever. Uh, like Lance Armstrong. I was like, I was a child of the Armstrong boom where... Yeah, I was 12 or 13 and 99 when he won the tour. And like, I didn't know what the Tour de France was. <laughs> like, it's like, why are they with a yellow jersey? Like, I, I, it's embarrassing. I thought it was like a, a, some type of like cancer event. I thought it was like a fundraising ride for cancer. Um, and then just kind of learned more. And I was like, well, I got to learn more about this event. Like, what's going on here? Um, and then would, well, I was probably consuming the publications that you were working for at the time. Um, any type of cycling publication I get my hands on, I would read and, you know, just followed the kind of the, the Ulrich Armstrong battle as it was happening throughout the years. It was, it's, it's actually people forget, like we've all moved on from Lance so much that it was like a big part of our lives, like seven years of tour wins and then just kind of happening in the background of everything. And I got like a, you know, I had like a Pacific, I think they were called like Pacifica or like a Pacific. It was like this bike you could buy at Walmart and would just go out. And we had a lot of, we didn't have paved roads. We just have like endless gravel roads, probably not safe to be out on as a kid, because if something happens to you, you're just in the middle of nowhere. No one's ever going to find you. Um, but I would like watch Lance at the tour and then like go out and ride on my crappy Walmart bike on these gravel roads um, so in many ways I did invent gravel cycling. I do want to take credit for that. Um, I will look out for those royalty checks from unbound any, any day. And then I read a book called, I don't know if you've read, it's a very good book called the death of Marco Pantani. And that kind of blew my mind. Cause I was like, Whoa, like there's this whole other, there's other races that aren't the tour de France. And there was like this whole other era before Lance and, and just kind of the whole scene of, of Italian cycling specifically, like really drew me in. And, and at that point I started kind of going back and there's this great company called world cycling productions and you could buy DVDs and you could watch like any race. Actually, I think it's kind of people talk about like we have iPhones and everything you ever want is on your phone, but there's like ev this entire generation of content that's just getting lost as we migrate away from um, older technology where it's like, yeah, like if I want to watch the 1992 Gant Wevel game, like how do I do that? Like hopefully it's on YouTube, but that back catalog was so accessible with World Cycling Production DVDs. So I would just like buy these DVDs online. They would come in the mail and then I'd be like sitting in the living room, like taking notes, watching like the 1994 Giro d'Italia. And, and there's just great characters like T Pavel Tonkov, where it's like, what's this Russian guy doing in Italy? And he's like, He's so unshakable and Bantani so emotional. And it just, I think the, the window into cultures and, and the personalities of the writers really, it, it was really drew me in. Was 92 Gent Wevelgem, was that the race where the Gevis team had three riders just ride up the road and drop everyone riding at like 45 RPM? Yes, yes this was, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was like the beginning of the EPO era and some teams and some riders had access to EPO and some didn't. And we got to see some pretty, pretty spectacular performance at, at those spring classics. I think one year, Roubaix, I think Mape swept the podium, which is crazy to think about. 
Yeah, yeah, 92. That was like the Jello blood era. I think people's hematocrits were so high. Uh, for some writers, it was incredibly dangerous. It's also good to hear that you invented gravel. I, of course, the follow-up question is, what is the spirit of gravel? <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't think of anyone more. I, I'm obsessed obsessed with gravel. I think about it all the time. Um, I do. I mean, I I like to rag on gravel, and I think it's funny that in my mind they're like, um, it'd be like it's kind of like when white European explorers like <laughs> discovered the Pacific Ocean. Be like, wow, no one's ever la- laid eyes on this. It's like people have been here. For, since the beginning of time, looking at the Pacific Ocean, like, what are you talking about? Um, I kind of feel like gravel is in some ways like that, where it's like, do you, can you believe there's non-paved roads that you can race on? But I, I do really respect the gravel scene and that it has, it, I think it has widened the aperture of who, who's interested in cycling, who can be interested in it. And it's, it's all these really cool places that would never r- embrace cycling. Like we were just, we were, a peek behind the curtain just recording my podcast talking about emporia kansas in in no way was a cycling hub you would you'd be chased out of town for being spotted in spandex on a bike 20 years ago and now like that's got to be one of the big economic engines of the community is this massive race they have every year so the fact that it's like getting these um i guess for like the lack of better term like red state locations like introducing them into cycling and and introducing the cyclists to the great roads there that are available to ride and the community i think the community aspect is so cool um that you're there i think that's what i i worry about with the uci coming into gravel where it's like okay we've all seen this movie before like all right it's a uci event you have to be uci licensed you got to be a quote-unquote pro to race um it's a hundred people everyone else is just watches and then over time it just kind of kills the event and kills the spirit of it. I love that it's everyone. It's like 3000 people in downtown Emporia starting the race together. I think that's so cool. And that you get to ride the same course as the pros and you get to see how much faster they're going than you. I think that's something that I don't think is really necessary at tip tippy top world to a racing, but I think it's something that's missing from a lot of cycling where it's just like, Growing up in Kansas, I, you know, meeting a pro cyclist seemed impossible. Uh, but I was always just fascinated, like, how much faster are they riding than us? Like, how could this be possible? So, I think that's so cool that people are just out there on the same roads as the pros, uh, getting to compare themselves. Jumping back to Pantani for a moment, was the Carrera acid wash denim uh, <laughs> bibs were were those the coolest bibs ever in professional cycling? Uh, yes, and I think that actually this everything's connected so far where if you showed up to a gravel race in that kit, it would Rafa could not keep it in stock if they introduced that to sell to gravel racers now. Um, yes, I, I do think the <laughs> yeah, the Carrera and I never it's not it's Carrera, it's not Carrera marble, I assume, or is that? I, I, love I always like, thought it was, I, I believe it is a jeans company. I believe Carrera oh, a was jeans. a jeans company and that's why they were acid washed like jorts because they have like their pockets on there. Yes. You, yeah. Everything connects back to jeans. You know, again, like we recorded an episode for Spencer's podcast. We were talking about what a big role jeans played in domestic American cycling uh, around 2006, 2008. You can go listen to that episode to find out more, find the link in the show notes. But yeah, Pantani, he had he had the acid washed power just helping him blast up the mountain. <laughs> and that probably explains a lot of his success as a racer. Is yeah. The acid, acid wash kits. There is like a I mean a lot of his it was like this Italian hard to explain if you weren't if you're not like following the Italian kits of the 90s. I would say like undeniably ugly. It's like first impression. These are the ugliest kits I've ever seen. This is crazy that they're riding on them, but like also in some ways attractive, like, um, and now that Rafa's made like the, the plain, you know, the, the plain kit so popular, I do wonder if like, you know, to go back to the theme of everything cycling, like, are we just going to go back to like the loud sponsors everywhere 
blue like it was the the classic thing would be like your leg warmers were some bright color like blue and then your kits would also be blue which now would never be allowed in in the rough after the rough of it rafaization of cycling yeah i think that the ugliest kits ever had to be either i think castorama which was finyan's team after super U system U. I think castorama had the ugliest kits ever and buckler beer might have been second I, do you think I I think Kelme is a sleeper pick? I Something kinda, about the, I kind of like the Kelme kit. <laughs> no? This is I think yeah it's like one man's trash is another man's treasure with these kits. Where I I might wear the Carrera Carrera jeans kit. I think I think that could be popular if you brought it back. I absolutely I think it could be huge. I actually think it's what's next in this podcast. It starts. It starts here. It starts now. It starts it starts with the acid wash denim. You know, I I know you mentioned that uh, that Pantani book had a big impact, but where did your cycling career, so to speak, like take you? How did you get into racing, and then how did that merge with your interest in writing and becoming a content creator with your own empire? <laughs> That's a generous use of the term empire. Um, I, I was so I was like really into I, I was actually kind of like pre-puberty like a really bad I was just bad at sports just bad at everything and then I just remember one day being like I'm sick of this like I suck I suck at everything um, and I was like a cold <laughs> I'll never it was like a cold like January day and I just went to the track by myself I, I must have been young like I'm like 10 years old I was like and I had watched this movie called Prefontaine which is a bad movie about a, it's a really interesting story. Um, not a good movie at all. Uh, there's a better movie called without limits about Steve Prefontaine. And I just like started doing like mile, you just would run a mile on the track. And then the next day would go and try to like run it faster and then try to do it faster. And eventually like in a year I was like winning, like, like national competitions for like middle school running and then went to uh there was as i lived in the sticks in the middle of nowhere and i just remember thinking like you know i'm like 12 i'm like i just my upside potential is really limited by this location i got to get out of here i got to get to a city um there was a great coach track coach in lawrence kansas called steve heffernan he coached at lawrence free state which was like a newer high school just opened had a really good middle distance program so i like convinced my parents i was like i gotta go like I'm moving you know, like 13 at the time. I'm like, I'm moving across the state. Um, I think I can find the coach can like find some house for me to live in. And I'm just going to be running at this high school. Uh, and my parents like blinked first. And so we all moved to Lawrence, Kansas I was running in high school. You know, that was a big part of my identity at the time. I think uh, looking back, I probably was, you know, I have like really conflicted emotions about like how big sports should be in a kid's life where I probably gave up a lot just to focus on running. Cause I was like, I remember like the Beijing, uh, it was announced the 2008 Olympics would be in Beijing. I'd be like, well, that's where I'll be in 2008. Like never been to China. I'm, I'm excited to see what it's like. And <laughs> that's, all, that's <laughs> awesome. I love it. <laughs> I was young. I was like 13 at the time. Um, and it's like a freshman, you know, I like, I almost won state in the mile as a freshman. I remember I was like disappointed. I was like, God, this is a crushing disappointment. Um, and I had a great sophomore year. And then I just kind of, I, there was like, you know, instability at home. I started to like probably burn out mentally because I had been training hard since I was 10. And, you know, really was just struggling. I was partying a lot, like a lot, got into kind of like you know punk rock elements at my school and, and at the time it was it was good because i was meeting different people people that weren't just on sports teams um but i was and it was a college town so there was like a lot of entertainment available that probably wasn't age appropriate for a high schooler and, and you know really i i just did not i didn't really improve because i was like you know when you're hung over on like a tuesday as a 15 year old that's gonna affect your performance and went to college, joined a fraternity. And I, I actually, I was a mess at the time. I have no memory of applying to the University of Kansas. I still, to this day, am not convinced I applied. I think I just showed up and started to attending classes and they were like, let me go. And I actually was lucky enough to get into, it was a pretty good fraternity that 
and I have mixed feelings about fraternities. I didn't love my time there, but it was super structured. So the first semester you're like, you know, no TV, you're studying, you know, you get like two 30 minute breaks during the day for like fun time, or you can go to the gym. And that like really kind of got me back on the right path. You know, I like got to college and like stopped partying as much. And, you know, and then after like a couple of years, it's like, you know, I would love to get back into like, you know, running, but maybe, maybe that's not so fun because running is kind of boring. Um, I was like, I, I always wanted to ride a bike, but I just couldn't afford it. Like, you know, trying to convince your parents to ride, to buy you a road bike, like an expensive road bike in high school, like they're just not going to do it at most income levels. And I just went to like a store and got like a cheap bike, like $150 steel framed road bike. I went out, I remember I was in bike shorts and I was like getting harassed. I was like getting harassed. Like probably it was un unsafe. Um, it was a different time in America. I don't think like, um, I, <laughs> it was, it was looking back, I am like surprised I just didn't get beat up by like a car of people, but you know, I just started riding a lot. I remember it was the 2008 Tour de France, Carlos Sastra won, which looking back was probably disappointing race for a lot of people. But I was like, this is so cool. Like, this is such a great race. Um, and then I found out you could race, which blew my mind. Like, what? You can race bikes in, in Lawrence, Kansas? This is nuts. Um, so it's like I went out. There's, there's all these, like, race series out by the lakes there and like showed up and won the race and i was like whoa like this is this is pretty cool like you can win and you get money like this is this is interesting and then you know for the next few years like that was my new obsession was just you know learning everything about bike racing racing wherever i could um traveling just insane distances I and mean, when you're in the midwest racing it's like like chicago you know that's only nine hours that's pretty close like let's go up and race this weekend um, and quickly went from like cat five to, you know, cat three, like in like a couple months and then eventually cat two. Uh, and then was a little, yeah, I was like a little bit out of my depth, uh, kind of fell out of racing for maybe a year or riding, riding at all for like a year, got kind of out of shape by the time I was graduating. And I remember thinking like, you know, I could go to like New York and work in finance, which is what I've wanted to do my whole life. Like, B, can you imagine being a junior analyst at JP Morgan? Like what an exciting job that would be. Um, but it's like, I just don't think, I just remember thinking like, I'll be dead by the time I'm 40. I'll just be, I'll be so unhealthy that, and I knew myself that if I moved to New York, I would not make time for being fit. I would not be healthy at all. Um, and I was sick of the cold. It was, Kansas is so cold. And I remember, I'd never been to Hawaii and I was like, Asked a friend, I'm like, have you ever been to Hawaii? And he's like, yeah, I went on vacation there a lot as a kid. And I was like, what island? He's like, Maui. And I was like, all right, I'm moving to Maui. This was like a month before I left school. So it's like, I really had no plan. And reached out to, there used to be this great, this great cycling blog, uh, Steve, Steve Tilford.com. Um, he's like yeah. tragically passed away since yep. then. And Steve was like a big influence in my writing. He was from Topeka, but you know, he would like write, he was always in Lawrence on bike rides, he's like, he was a big figure in the cycling community there. And he had gone to Maui and done a, like a ride. They, this company will like ride with you up the volcano and then you just send down. And I just emailed the guy, the owner and asked like, Hey, can I come be a guide for you? Um, and he said, yes. And we just had like one phone call and he said, yeah, just flying out and you can work for me. And I bought a ticket, one way ticket to Maui. Didn't know anyone there except this guy I just talked to on the phone and he picked me up at the airport. And then I showed up and I got in really good shape because I was riding all the time for my job. And then when I started to come back to the mainland or race, I was just like a completely different racer. And then kind of got the thought of like, well, maybe I could like do this full time. Like maybe I could be a professional cyclist. And then I had like a multi-year period where like, that's all I cared about. Um, and, and I got to like a mild level of success. It was not, you get to a point where like Travis McCabe would have been like the best case scenario for me. And like Travis McCabe is so good. And he had like a, a cup of coffee in the world tour. And then now he's retired. Um, it just gets so hard unless you're so, so talented or European and you're, you know, you're kind of able to plug into those races at a young age. It's just so difficult to really make a living doing it. That's a pretty incredible 
journey. And with, you know, when you were in the middle of that, when did you have that realization that this wasn't going to be your future? I, I don't know if I ever, I'll probably deep down, I'm like, maybe I will win the next year's Tour de France. <laughs> <laughs> Make a comeback. <laughs> um, I did, I had, a, I had a bad crash, I think it was 2015. And I had moved to Boulder, Colorado. I had met, I was doing these super fancy cycling camps. Uh, Ryder Hedger all would like, he was a big star at the time. This was like before the doping uh, stuff came out and he would host uh, it was like 20 people. We'd put them up at the Four Seasons. They were paying like $20,000 a week for it. And then we'd do rides around the island with like Ryder Hedgedal and uh, Tyler Farrar. Um, and one of the clients owned like an amateur racing team in Colorado, which had like good support. Like you got a stipend, you got a bike, you got free kits, you got to go to the races for free. And he was like, hey, if you want to come. And, and I, like a lot of credit to Ryder, a lot of credit to to the owner of the the bike tour company, they kind of like went to bat for me with this guy and were like, he's a good rider. Like you should take him on. And the guy's like, yeah, if you move to Colorado, you can be on my team. So I moved to Boulder in 2013 and then was just racing like a lot. But in 2015, I thought I was in great shape. Like, you know, you're always looking for that breakout season. I imagine it's like this in, in any sport where you're kind of on the cusp where you're like, this is the year I'm going to have a bat 400 and I'm going to get brought from AAA to the major leagues. Um, I thought I was in good shape, um, was off the front of a crit with one other guy. Like we probably would have won the race and I, it was, the, it was a dumb crash. I was just pedaling through a corner, um, just probably a little desperate for some extra power. And, you know, I didn't slide out. I kind of went over the handlebars and like kind of endowed onto my head and I had like a compound fracture, my collarbone. <sighs> And this was like a week before Tulsa Tough. And I was like, I'm going to go win Tulsa Tough. I'm going to win th all three races at Tulsa Tough. And it's going to be awesome. Um, and But it was like the season was done right there. I had to get surgery the next day. Um, and I, I think I, I've never quite been as into it since then. Um, I just remember like the fire kind of dying a little bit where I was like, oh, this is, this is serious. Like, and I put a lot of work into this and got nothing out of it. And I think like, I think if I was a more dedicated, if I was just more about that life, I would have been like, no, like I'm going to come back and, and, and like, this will be my, the beginning of like the, <laughs> the opening part of the championship DVD, but it, it, it just kind of break my spirit a little bit. But what happened is I was just laid up all July. So I just watched every stage of the tour de France, like basically start, I would wake up at like four when it started, it would finish at nine. And then I would go to my job at nine. But I really, it gave, it like opened my eyes up to like what you could observe watching races. And I noticed all these things guys were doing wrong that I probably wouldn't have noticed when I was is into racing. So that was kind of the beginning of me going from being all in on racing to being like, well, like, you know, analyzing races is pretty interesting. And, and you can notice a lot if you just pay attention. And I, I, I did race after that, but I don't think I was ever quite. Um, as into it and then now with strava you know I'm, gl I'm glad because it's like i can't do the watts per kilos these guys are doing like the the power it takes and how light you have to be to be at the front of a world tour race is is so insane that um retroactively I i'm glad i kind of never went all in after that how did that lead to you doing what you're doing now so i was at the time i was like working at the pros closet which um, they at the time sold like used bike stuff on eBay, but it was an, in an interesting job for me because we would go to teams, buy their old stuff, sell it on eBay. So you get to meet a lot of people that knew a lot about cycling. Um, and even a lot of the people like Sean Sullivan worked with me and he was on Barlow world back in the day. Um, he was on like uh, the Toyota United team, really good, really good racer, really smart about cycling. And we would just talk all day, every day about races. Like, oh, what'd you see this morning? What did you see this morning? Like, what do you think this guy did wrong? And and so after a year of that, I was like, you know, I was voracious consumer of like Velo News and cycling tips at the time. And I remember being like, I think I could be writing about this. And I just emailed Neil Rogers, um, like a pitch idea, who was like a 
like a celebrity to me at the time. I was like nervous to email him. And he's like, yeah, sure, write it. And I'll pay you some money. And which blew my mind. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, I'm going to be in cycling tips. This is nuts. Um, Wrote the piece. It was very hard. Um, Neil was like, yeah, I think you got a long ways to go before you could like, you know, really hone your craft, but you should keep doing it. And then I wrote, you know, I just kind of had a rate was regularly writing pieces for cycling tips. And then, and then kind of moved over to Velo News. And, and I was at like jobs that were, you know, were m- mildly interesting, but not that fulfilling. Um, and I remember I was kind of like fighting for a promotion at the job I was at. This must have been 2018. And I was thinking like, well, if I get this, like, am I even going to be happy? And like, if anything, I'll have to. And at the time, I, I was writing quite a bit about cycling. So it's like I'd be like in the parking lot on my computer in my car, like working on pieces while taking a break from work and that's what i wanted to be doing full time like i wanted just to be at home breaking down the races and telling people what was going on um and it just kind of kind of had a realization where i was like i think i gotta leave my job if i want to pursue this more and i did um and then i started it was like i started this blog called beyond the pelt on blog.com and i i i was really into you know treating cycling like it was a real sport instead of like fandom jur- journalism to be doing, you know, like Zach, I'm a big fan of like Zach Lowe or Nate Duncan with basketball, like the way they break it down and just kind of wanted to bring the same level of like seriousness and analytics and, you know, strategy discussion to cycling. And, you know, I look back at those old posts and they're, they're rough. It's like kind of embarrassing to read, but like the kernel of the idea was there. And then uh, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know where I got the idea. Like, I always read Ben Thompson's newsletter, Stratechery, Strate- Strate- and he would give you a free one once a week, and he would give a paid, subs- paid subscribers more posts. And we were thinking, like, oh, I wonder if this would work for cycling. And uh, COVID hit. I, a lot of I was doing some, like, other consulting work not to do with cycling, and it kind of dried up due to the initial COVID shock. And I was thinking, like, eh, maybe that's not the worst thing that could ever happen, and I'll just... You know, when, when racing starts, I'll, I'll break down the Tour de France every day and I'll just see where, how I feel at the end of the tour. And I did and just kept going because then the Giro started, then the Volta started and I kept doing it. The response was good. The newsletter, um, it, it grew a lot better than I thought it would. And, and then now I'm here. So, it, yeah, it wasn't, I didn't sit down and I was like, I'm going to ever, uh, start like, a newsletter where I break down cycling every day it just kind of gradually grew from the initial blog idea. Has it exceeded what you thought might be possible for this concept or is it about, you know, is this about how you thought it would go? I think it's exceeded. I mean, I, I kind of thought, you know, I'll do this for free for a year and just see where I am after that. Um, but then I also didn't want to give people tour de France daily coverage for free and then take it away in a year. I was worried that, you know, I'm always a big believer in like, you know, if you're getting something for free and then you have to pay for it, you're, it can leave a bad taste in your mouth. So it's like, I probably have to charge for this, at least for the daily coverage every day. Um, it, totally expecting no one to sign up, like not a single person. Um, but that was not the case. I mean, it was far more successful in that first year than I, than I thought it would be. What's been the hardest part about doing it for you? I think the, that's, the hardest part is, you know, I have a wife and a son, and I think it can be on the weekend sometimes, and I'm like, Sh- shot, like, keep quiet, I'm watching the race, and then I have to, like, run upstairs, and I'm, like, breaking down, like, little um, video clips. It can be, like, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> I could just be hanging out with the family in the backyard, but, you know, that is also – you know, I think that type of life is more for, obviously you always want work-life balance. And I, I do think I found a good way to balance it, um, especially on the weekends in the summer when it can be difficult. But, you know, if you want to work, you know, I have friends that are like higher up at, at big companies and, you know, they don't do that much on the weekends. It's, it's kind of a nice work-life balance they have. But, you know, to me, that work is a little bit I'm so lazy when I'm not interested in something, when I'm not totally bought in, it would be so hard for me to be just like a middle manager at kind of a generic big company that 
I think that my work, I would, I would think it would be a bad job that I would also be bad at. So, you know, for me, it's almost like this is the only thing that I could really be that passionate about, at least at the moment. So um, that helps me kind of power through what can be a difficult work, like work life balance at times. Yeah. And Spencer, I know I've shared with you and I think I might've said it already, but I'd love the content that you put out the depth of it, the breadth of it, uh, the level of analysis is incredible. And I mean, you know, everything you've described about your history and the sport, your deep understanding of strategy, tactics, your personal experience, I think with what it actually feels like to do this or try to do this at the highest level really comes through. And, you know, every time I get the subscriber newsletter, the, the level of depth and detail is such that I'm like, how did you turn this around like between that race ending yesterday and when this landed in my inbox today with all the, you know, the video clips that you do, the level of analysis, like how much time is going in to putting together something like that for, you know, a major one day race or a stage of a, a tour? It's, it's funny you say it's quick. Cause I'm always like, God, I'm behind. Like, it's too slow. This is too slow. Um, you know, it, it probably rule of thumb is it like takes twice as long as you think it's going to take. Um, but I try to, you know, I was on vacation doing the Volta this year with my family. So I was trying to be a little bit more mindful of the time. But, you know, normally, like if I'm at home, I'll watch a stage at the Tour de France. Let's say it finishes at 9, 930. I might try to go for a bike ride until like 11 um, just to kind of like think about the race, think about what what's happened. And then ideally, I like to get that that piece out by three or four. Uh, my son wakes up from his nap at like 4.30. So that's kind of my end point. Um, this summer, I really, at least when I was on vacation for the vault, I really had to like crunch it. So I'd almost be spending no more than like two hours at the computer. I'd set like a two hour timer and be like, you got to get this done in two hours. Um, and if you're not happy with it, like tough, tough luck, send it out. So I do try to do it as, as quickly as I possibly can. You seem to have access to a lot of information from inside of teams, different like writer agents. I don't know where your information comes from or if you can talk about it, but I am really curious. Like you said, you're watching the races unfold in real time. You also have a level of insight and access, or at least it feels like that from the outside. Can you talk at all about where are you getting your information from? Well, what's interesting about that is it's almost people, come, a lot of people come to me, like people will reach out and be like, you know, you said this, I think you're missing this piece of information that you should know. Um, and a lot of times it's rider agents just because they have the time during races to be paying attention. Um, the riders themselves, you know, aren't, aren't paying attention as much, but right. um, riders, yeah, it's a lot of people will just like reach out like Twitter direct message and be like, Hey, you said this, I think you should know this detail. So it's really a mix of like stakeholders and it, I, you would, you would be shocked at the amount of team managers that reach out to me. Um, I would say good. Uh, I have a good portion of the Peloton's managers as paying subscribers and they definitely let me know when they think I've gotten something wrong. <laughs> and sometimes I, I disagree with their takes, but sometimes it's, it's valuable, like added information. Yeah. That's awesome. Cause it's not easy to cultivate sources at that, at that level. And I think it speaks to the, the quality of the product you're putting out and the level of respect that it's commanding. So, you know, that's awesome. Congratulations. And as you think about where you're going to take the project next or like where you're headed with this, as you, as you noted, when you're a solopreneur, it can be challenging to find work-life balance. Also, when you're doing what you love, that does make it um, a bit more palatable, I think. But over time, what's the plan? Yeah. I mean, think, I've been thinking about this a lot recently. It is hard. You know, it's a hard grind when you're by yourself. Um, I do think the freedom, though, energizes me. Like, I could be difficult to do it for someone else. Um, I mean, the smart play would be, like, my basement's just a cube farm, and there's, like, 15 people down there constantly watching races and ghost riding for me. Um, like if I was actually building a business, that's like what I would do. But, you know, I, I do want it to be personal. So it is hard for me to ever imagine just like someone else is riding beyond the Peloton that doesn't feel right. Um, you know, I, I do think 
I would like to expand, you know, either bulk up myself and expand out into like, I love watching F1. I'm all, I'm often like, well, I, I don't understand the sport that enough. I need someone to tell me like what the heck just happened. Like, I wish I was getting like an F1 breakdown in my inbox or via podcast. Um, so I, I would love to like expand out where I'm like servicing other passionate communities that maybe are a little bit ignored by at least English language m- mainstream media. Um, you know, a strategic sale or partnership could be something I would consider. Uh, you know, I've been approached by a few bigger, you know, some legacy, some upstart cycling media companies. I'll let people come to their own conclusions about what that could be. Um, just to, about things as far, you know, like outright sale to, you know, some type of uh, integration of the the membership. So, you know, I would, I think it could be fun, you know, at least some type of podcast partnership where, you know, kind of my dream is to be like, you know, uh, to be partnered with someone really smart, like, uh, like Marco Panati or even PZ's controversial people don't like him but i think johan Bernil is like a genius when it comes to cycling tactics like i would love to have a podcast with johan Bernil. i think that would be so fun like the dumbest guy in pro cycling and the smartest guy in pro cycling and i'm just like grilling him about what the heck's going on and why i disagree with you know maybe his particular take on something so i do think you know some type of podcast partnership would be something i would seriously consider I'm a little bit more protective of the newsletter though. It feels a little bit more like my baby. So I am having a hard time wrapping my head around like selling it and then just becoming a writer for some company. That's kind of what I wanted to avoid in the first place. So to answer your question, I don't really have a good answer. I do know that I would like to expand and maybe hire some support staff in the future though. You mentioned that that Pantani book is what, you know, that was one of the original catalysts that really got you into competitive cycling. When you think about, you know, the canon of books about or by professional cyclists, do you have a favorite? Yeah, I feel like someone asked me this yesterday. I feel like I like I'm like a fraud with cycling books. I don't know. I mean, I love Slaying the Badger by the I think if Richard Moore is the author, it's about the battle between Bernard No and Greg LeMond and I believe the 1986 tour. Um, I, I almost though I'm drifting. <laughs> there's also this, I, there's this book called like Greg LeMond's cycling tactics. I think it's very good. Um, it's like kind of cheesy, but a lot of stuff in there is like a lost art. I feel um, where it's like attack in the corners where I don't think people do that anymore. I I don't think people really sit down and think about like the basics of cycling 101, even, even riders who are very good. Like um, I don't want to point anyone out, but like maybe a young American who is racing in the world tour maybe has like never been told this, you know, it's possible. I feel feel like you actually do want to point someone out, but you don't have to. I I know. I I would feel because I don't know if they know that or not. Yeah, it's cool. Um, And I will just say, I will say, I thought Quinn Simmons was outfoxed by a, by a more experienced, older rider. I believe that was stage 18 of this year's Vuelta España, where you can see Quinn Simmons is a 20-year-old American who, I mean, 20 is really young to be racing in the World Tour. So any success is impressive. But you could tell like, oh, this guy just got like, like Valgren knew what he was doing and he just kind of worked him over. Um Kids should go back and watch that, learn what not to do. But there's this guy, he's a writer called John Foote. He, he writes about Italian cycling, but almost it's the cycling's like the second part. He'll, he's just kind of like an Italian historian kind of, and he'll write books about how sports kind of frame Italian history. I think, I mean, John Foote is, is uh, definitely one of my idols as, as far as writers go and what he can tell you about a larger issue when it comes to a sport. Um, and, and then I feel like, yeah, maybe I don't read enough sports books. All I've been reading about all I'm obsessed with. Uh, <laughs> I only read about like Weimar Germany, the fall of the, the Weimar Republic uh, before Nazism. That's like my obsession at the moment. I have little time for reading about cycling. Um, there is, I do feel like, I don't know if you ever, there's this guy, John Feinstein, he would write, he would like embed himself with like a basketball team for a year and then write about the team. Um, 
you know, I think maybe because cycling is is predominantly not an English language sport, there's probably piece books like that out there about cycling, but I'm just not aware of them in an English translation. There's like a certain kind of book about the professional cycling experience. And I think just an aspect of professional cycling, I personally am really drawn to, which is the journeyman or journeywoman writer grinding away. And I like Phil Guyman's books for that reason. Charlie Wagelius's book, I found to be really compelling and same. I can't remember the name of the writer, but dog in a hat that, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 Like, I love that, like, genre of just people who are, you know, domestiques or journeyman writers and, like, what it takes to get to that level. And is, I mean, as you pointed out, the physiology and ability to tap the lights on the wall and, like, process information just to be at that level is insane. Like, there are so, so few athletes that can get to that level in pro cycling even relative to the most elite level in all other sports there just aren't that many slots at the world tour level and you know only a handful of those riders actually ever get to win a race but they need everybody else to do it and i find the stories about what people sacrifice to get into that position and do over time to be there to be insane but i'm looking forward to checking out the the books that you mentioned. I also wanted to give a shout out to that, uh, the Thomas Prenn book, Racing Tactics for Cyclists. I don't know if you're a fan of that one, but that, that's another racing strategy and tactics book that I uh, I dig. I'm going to go pull that Le Mans one out again now too. Um, I should say, t- I mean, the, I can't believe I didn't mention it. It's called the Just the Writer by Tim Crabbe. Tim Crabbe? Oh, Tim yeah. Tim Crabbe. I mean, that is like, that's like a Pantheon cycling book. I would, if you're, like a person interested in racing bikes, like that book sums up the mentality perfectly. You mentioned when you first started riding in Lycra and I think it was in Lawrence or whenever you started riding in Lycra when you were like 15, it felt kind of dangerous. And I can tell you when I started doing that myself in Kansas city and the, the late eighties, yeah, it wasn't a super common thing. What, uh, can you describe the, did you ever have things thrown at you from vehicles while you were riding your bike? Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm cheating. You've said this in a previous conversation, but yeah, the bit, the big gulp is like, uh, I think that is the, the staple to throw at cyclists. Yeah, I agree. The big gulp, um, particularly when it's, it's filled with, why am I spacing out on, oh yeah, Slurpee, like the big Slurpee, gulp Slurpee. Yeah. That's like kind of like a refreshing hit to take on like a hundred degree day in the Midwest, you know, when you get like the Coke Slurpee thrown at your face. But it is, that was a big, um, because Hawaii has a reputation as like, it is a rough place. It's a tough place. Like, you know, if you, like, if you do the wrong thing, like no one will hesitate to just beat you up, you know, to like show you what you did wrong. But going there and like, people were so much nicer on the roads than I was used to in Kansas. I really couldn't believe it. Nice. So Spencer, if people want to learn more about you, find out more about what you're doing or subscribe to the newsletter, where do they go? Uh, you can go to beyondthepeloton.substack.com to sign up for the newsletter. Um, and that will have, that should be a hub for, for any other content. There is the uh, Beyond the Peloton podcast should be everywhere you can get a podcast spotify and apple at least awesome and all you apple listeners go find that i'll put the link in the show notes hit subscribe give spencer five stars spencer thanks so much for your time it's been awesome to hear a bit more about your journey and thanks so much for the content that you're bringing into the world it's great well thanks for thanks for taking the time to read and listen andrew and thanks for having me on it was great to be here If you have questions, comments, feedback, or want to suggest a guest, please reach out to at Hardway Pod on social or email me at choosethehardway at gmail.com. Please take a moment to leave a one word review and hit five stars in iTunes. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. You are what you overcome. Choose the hard way.